to discuss and look at the year 2017 review and outlook for 2018 is my colleague in the ProShare Research Unit, Tenitopo Babalala. Great to have you. What an eventful year 2017. Yes, certainly it is. But thank you for having me once again. Yes. And so when we look at the year 2017, of course, we exited from recession. What are those key other activities that you see shaped the Nigerian economy space? I think one of the major things that occurred in 2017 was the exchange rate. The exchange rate. The exchange rate was very important because if you go back to 2016, you had a Naira which was already experiencing overshoots. Therefore, you had a, you had the Naira which certain times were hitting about 500 or 520. It hit 520 by February. So for it as at the tail end of 2017 to be at 360, that itself is also a very, that's a very, very major plus. Secondly, it's that we must also take into consideration is that the PMI was also important because for this year, you've had about nine successive months of expansion. Mm -hmm. So that is also very important because those two are leading indicators. When you have those two, it also reassures you that the economy is actually exiting out of recession. Then thirdly was that you also found that the outputs also began to grow faster. As at the second quarter, we had our first growth, which was about 0.55%. And when it was actually readjusted in the third quarter, it was about 0.9%. And by the third quarter, which we finally exited, we had about 1.4%. You know, that 1.4% really hit many people as a shock. Yes. Because really, it also beat the, the, the forecast by even the IMF. World IMF and, and World, World Bank. Bank. Yeah. Because I think the World Bank was about 0.8. Oh, yeah. And I think the IMF was about 1.2. So yeah. you realize that it was actually beat estimates. Yeah. And thirdly was that because you had an increase in oil price, our reserves also improved. Another very important factor was that our, ex our external trade also improved because the truth is when oil prices increases, for a country whereby 95% of its exports as oil, it also increases, the value of your exports also increases. Mm -hmm. By that alone, our exports, our um, external trade also improved, which was key. So you had, you had a circumstance whereby exchange rate was favorable, where the Naira gained, you had, so, um, you had expansion, successive expansions in the PMI. You also had improved outputs, which was also very important. Thirdly was that you had external trade also improve. So you had your merchandise, your capital trade also become gradually tilted into or up the up end. And I think those are very substantial factors because when you see leading indicators like that improve, it gives you the green light that the economy is quantitatively is better off. Now growth on one hand, but we have high unemployment which, of course, is a concern to all stakeholders. Now, when you see growth on one hand and unemployment, look at Nigeria's unemployment rate, 18.8%, after South Africa, which is 27.7%, that's the second highest in the BRICS and MINT category. Now, what, what, what would you say are the key issues driving this and, and the structural economy, and what can be done to really, really curb this as we're entering uh, New Year? The truth is this, is that you had an economy where for a very long time your industrial capacity really has been suboptimal. And the manufacturing sector is a country whereby you must always have, high, it, it's a major employer of labor, but for us it has relatively been very low. And don't forget that for some time you also had the likes of Dunlop Banco who actually exited this country. And what they did, you also had, what you find out is that job rates also fall. Yeah. So by that time you find out that we also had high levels of structural unemployment. But as of 2016, when we actually fell into a recession, the cyclical factors came in. Most firms also, in an attempt to reduce their exposures to margin, marginal um, compression, also had to shed off weight. You know, when you, are, when you find yourself in such circumstances like a recession, it takes a longer time for you to uh, readjust fixed costs. But you know, it, you can actually readjust your operating costs faster. So the first thing that comes to, your, to you as the manager is to shed off weight. And by so doing, unemployment also increased. So you have that. So at that particular point in time, you also had, you have a combination of both structural unemployment and cyclical unemployment. Cyclical because the cycle, the business cycle as at that time, you already had a negative turn. Structural in the sense that your economy over time had had a very low level of industrial capacity. And you've, like we've always said, our productive levels in this country is really very low. So when you have a very low productive level in a country, it's where you always have substantial high unemployment. How do you drive that productive level? Because when you look at some economies, um, even in Asia, you're seeing a lot of productivity, like in Asia. We talk about Japan, South Korea. Despite all their challenges, there's that productivity. We look at their unemployment rate, at least not over 10%. It's at least a, that range of under 10%. 
Well, the fact is this, is that a productive economy in any way is always driven by one infrastructure, your ease of doing business, ensuring you have the, prep and the proper um, le legislations that ensure that I can do business, which is key. If you don't have the right infrastructure, which I know very well will drive operating costs, most investors will actually be averse because my cost, my actual, my running cost is very high. That is a very serious problem. So you bring down, when you are able to bring, when you are able to bring down your operating cost, it, what it does is that it also imp it improves your accessibility to also FDIs and also ensures that private capital formation itself can take an uplift. But if you don't have that, what you have is that you find an economy which is more driven by trade or service. So that's the truth. Okay, now we're entering the year 2018 a very strategic year for Nigeria because it's a pre-election year. 2019 is the general elections. Do we have some uh, state elections uh, in Oshun and in Ekiti in 2018? What will be the key things that will shape the year? And looking at the unemployment, we'll come again to that. What can be done? It's one year for this government, present government, to, to make a mark. Remember the political rhetoric of three million jobs a year? Well, <laughs> the truth is this, is that you have to get your real sector going. If you look at the headline, going beyond the headline growth, we found that, that what drove, what is driving growth is actually the oil sector. So you have an oil sector which grew by 25.5%. You have a manufacturing sector which is within the bloodletting zone. You have the financial sector which is also within the bloodletting zone. Surprisingly, financial sector. You also have the construction sector which grows by 0.4%. You have the real sector, which is also within the bloodletting zone. And let's not also forget is that you also have trade, which is also within the bloodletting zone. So all these indicators, including ICT. ICT is, is like the prospective driver in the fourth okay. industrial revolution. Thank you. So all these indicators all show that you cannot get, you cannot get, you can, and unemployment really will always have to rise. And don't forget that you are also looking at a country whereby it has been growing below its potential growth. And in the last two years, it has also been growing far below its, annual, its population growth. 3% population <laughs> growth. So there's no how, in such terms, you, you are going to have a swell in unemployment. So the truth is this, is that solving unemployment really takes, it takes on, for a country like ours, which is structurally driven, it will take between the short to mid. But then you have to take the, the, the right policies are needed policies that will drive the real sector, policies that will ensure foreign direct investment, policies that is aimed at ensuring that manufacturing sector is driven. And two is that you also have to have the kind of policies that drive the construction sector. And I'll give you a good example. During the US, 2008, when you had the crisis, the Obama administration, the Obama administration you must understand that there were two sectors. The Obama administration Auto was so quick to give to the automo the automobile industry. Yeah. You know, because you know the importance of that. Yeah. Secondly was that, when you drive the mortgage, you indirectly, when you give, drive the mortgage like the way Benake did, yeah. you're indirectly driving both the construction sector and the real sector. And you know that you are going to drive jobs, both indirect and direct jobs, one way or the other. So when you get that right, it also helps to draw down, to bring down unemployment. So we have to get the construction sector going. We have to get the real sector going. We have to get the manufacturing sector. We also have to get the financial sector going. The financial sector. Yes, because it's important. If you have, so, so if you, by, if you have successive slumps in the financial sector, it could also drive you to a level of a recession. It could drive you back to a recession, which is very key. So monetary policy also has a, a role in that regard. It has a role in that regard, yeah. and that is very important. So those are key. But then, what the truth is that there's no one, there's no one, um, there's no one solution to solving unemployment. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's 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 a. You must have different a lot of spanners in your kit box that must but, address. But, but one major issue there is that the government should have a pro business approach. What do you think? Yes, government must have a pro because, business. Because you know, there's a notion by um, German finance minister Wolfgang Schäuble that government does not create jobs; it just creates a enabling environment for jobs. And recently, we've been having that challenge of government realizing its role of enabling environment than creating jobs. Yes, countries that have been able to provide the right enabling environment have been able to also ensure that they create jobs. It, it has a rippling effect. There's a limit to how much jobs government can provide 
in an in a country whereby your labor force is about 18 million. 